Well, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today in the beautiful Devonian Gardens in Calgary to announce Alberta's path forward to reduce emissions while growing our economy. Before I begin, I'd like to want to acknowledge some of my wonderful colleagues and close personal friends who are here with me today. Tanya Fur, Josephine Pawn, Prasad Panda, and Rajan Sani. Uh, without colleagues like this, our job is much harder. So thank you for being here today. I would also like to acknowledge members from my advisory committee who are here today to watch or who are watching online. Um, watching this work online. These are exemplary Canadians who stepped up to share their expertise to help Albertans with a plan that they can be proud of. Thank you for your contribution and thank you for making it possible. I see some of you here in the audience today. Alberta has been a leader in climate and emissions reduction policy for more than 20 years. Our province was the first jurisdiction in Canada to establish a climate plan and that was in 1998. Alberta was the first jurisdiction in Canada to in introduce an industrial carbon price, which took effect in 2007, more than 15 years ago. Alberta was the first subnational government in North America to bring in emission reduction targets for oil and gas, for methane. We released our annual progress report earlier this month, which shows that Alberta is on track to meet and exceed this methane emission target, well ahead of schedule. This leadership is achieved by working with others to carefully design policy that is suited specifically for Alberta. This enables emissions reductions and capitalizes on economic op opportunity, opportunities, opportunities such as hydrogen, opportunities such as the net zero petrochemical complex, opportunities such as bioenergy, carbon capture utilization and storage, and bitumen beyond combustion. With the release and implementation of this new plan I'm here to announce today, Alberta will continue to have a robust climate and energy framework in place. And Alberta will continue to achieve real and timely emissions reductions with a strong focus on innovative technology that benefits Alberta and other jurisdictions all over the world for years to come. We have invested billions of dollars from the Technology, Innovation and Emissions Reduction Fund, our tier fund, into programs and projects that drive emissions reduction and support resilience through research and technology. This includes supporting partners, partners like Emissions Reduction Alberta, which invests tier funds for pioneering projects and clean technology solutions for industry to accelerate innovation, stay competitive, and stimulate economic growth. Programs through Emissions Reduction Alberta benefit industries of all sizes across all sectors, targeting innovation in the oil sands, electricity, heavy industry, waste and the circular economy, food, farming, forestry, carbon capture, utilization and storage. Alberta, in particular, is recognized as a leader in CCUS, carbon capture. We've committed already more than $1.8 billion to CC, CCUS projects to date. We're building upon this, uh, this uh, investment with more than 25 CCUS hubs that were awarded in, 25, in 2022. Hubs across the province, if built, that would decarbonize industries in every corner of the province. Industries from oil and gas and oil sands to electricity, fertilizer, uh, pet cam, uh, hydrogen, and more. Large-scale support for CCUS is critical for meeting Canada's long-term energy needs and climate goals. In fact, the International Energy Agency has said there is no path to net zero without CCUS, and that's in Alberta, Canada, or anywhere globally. And Alberta, I'm very proud to say, is one of the glo global leaders in this game-changing technology, having taken considerable st steps in the past to commercialize this technology, we funded it, and we have a regulatory process in place. All of these actions have resulted in emissions reductions, but we know there is more work left to do. And that's why we've developed this new Made in Alberta Climate Plan that builds on our successes and explores new areas of opportunity. 
Today, it is my pleasure to announce the next step in Alberta's emissions reduction and energy development evolution. Alberta's new emissions reduction and energy development plan charts our course for cutting emissions, attracting investment, working with Indigenous communities, and supporting good paying jobs along with affordable, reliable, and secure energy. It builds on the good work that Alberta has do been doing in this space for decades, and it presents new actions and opportunities that will cut emissions while keeping our economy strong. This practical plan will reduce emissions and maintain energy security with a focus on collaboration and partnerships, clean technology and innovation, finance and policy frameworks. Alberta has unique economic circumstances and, em and an emissions profile that require an Alberta made in Alberta approach and our plan delivers. As a domestic energy supplier with about one quarter of our provincial GDP from emissions intensive and trade exposed sectors, emissions reduction policy is more than environmental policy in Alberta. It is also strategic, economic, energy, social, and industrial policy. Done properly, emissions policy can be used to attract investment in innovative emissions reduction technologies and low emission industries that diversify and strengthen our economy and create and protect jobs. Alberta is focused on emission reduction outcomes and energy security, not eliminating specific industries or types of natural resources. Instead of moving away from hydrocarbons, our plan shows that we are using these resources in new and different ways so that our province can continue to provide sustainably produced energy to the world. The plan recognizes that oil and gas will continue to be a key part of the global energy mix in the coming decades. And the plan maintains Alberta's strong position as a global supplier of responsibly produced energy, extending beyond oil and gas, extending into hydrogen, LNG bioenergy and renewables, carbon capture. The plan emphasizes that Alberta can and must be part of the solution to safeguard North American and global energy security. And it supports new low emission sectors that create economic activities and opportunities. And it requires, those, those industries require the skills and resources that Alberta already has in-demand expertise that will continue to provide quality jobs for future generations. The plan also pursues a net, net zero by 2050 aspiration. This will not be achieved easily or overnight, but we will, in true Alberta fashion, roll up our sleeves and doggedly pursue this aspiration while prioritizing affordable, reliable and secure energy and protecting our economy. Our net zero aspiration has a tailored, reasonable and responsible plan at its core. We will continue to build on this plan by focusing on our province's collective strengths and opportunities. The fact is that cutting emissions should not make life harder and more expensive. That's why Alberta's emission reduction and energy development plan includes actions like modernizing the electricity system, to help keep energy secure and affordable for Albertans, while also enabling a lower emissions electricity grid. This will be, be achieved by helping develop and deploy new technologies to green and diversify electricity, such as CCUS projects to abate emissions for natural gas-fired electricity generation. This includes integrating hydrogen, advancing small modular nuclear reactors, and geothermal, as well as renewables and energy storage systems. Our plan highlights include, on top of the net zero aspiration, includes establishing tables to incorporate youth and indigenous insight into the implementation of this plan. We're looking at pathways to reduce methane emissions by 75 to 80 percent from 2030 levels by 2014 levels. The current, uh, the current target is 25 percent by 20, pardon me, 45 percent by 2025. We're looking we're looking at pathways to see if we can increase that. We're exploring reducing the oil sands emissions limit, the 100 megaton cap. We, we believe that can be lowered. We're investing $25 million from the tier fund into ERA to support hydrogen development. There's a huge opportunity to develop hydrogen, both domestically and internationally. 
We're reviewing the renewable fuel standards regulation, including expanding it to include other fuels, such as sustainable aviation fuel. And we're establishing a nature-based solutions framework with a variety of tools to support conserving biodiversity and mitigating emissions. The Emissions Reduction and Energy Development Plan is the next chapter in a long history of environmental leadership in Alberta. It will build a thriving economy while cutting emissions. It will guide Alberta on its path to becoming an even stronger and more prominent global leader in emissions reductions, innovation and technology, and sustainable resource development. Alberta has a well-established and globally recognized record of environmental protection and conservation that goes hand in hand with development of our energy resources. Our plan commits Alberta to building necessary pathways to support a low carbon future while driving Alberta towards economic and environmental outcomes that will ensure that our province, that our province remains strong. As this pr plan evolves over time, it will be con continue to be supported by the ingenuity, talent, expertise, and the incredible entrepreneurial spirit of Alberta's industry. Our business communities are well known for that. I look forward to seeing Alberta's realistic and deliberate plan in action to the benefit of our environment, our economy, and all Albertans today and into the future. I'll pass things over to Miguel to take any questions. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, so we will move to questions on the floor if we have any. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, we have a microphone here on the floor. Yeah, go ahead. You're here. You can see me, Minister. Hi, James Miller. I'm the president and CEO of the International CCS Knowledge Centre. So first off, thank you for your leadership. Thank you to your team and the government for its leadership. Perhaps a somewhat biased question, but allow me to ask it. You talked a lot about carbon capture and storage. Just again, if you could reiterate the importance of that technology if we want to reach our climate goals in Canada and indeed globally. Thank you. Well, as, as, I, as I did mention, it's, it's, there is no path to net zero in, in the world. In Canada, Alberta, anywhere globally, there is no path to net zero without carbon capture utilization and storage. And I believe the numbers are we can mitigate and we can eliminate and sequester about 25% of global emissions using this proven technology. Now, we're fortunate because Alberta has shown early leadership in CCUS. We have we developed a regulatory system that other jurisdictions are looking at to be able to uh, to replicate. We are we have some two two world-class projects that are commissioned and they're in service, the Quest project and the longest carbon tr trunk line in Alberta, the ACTL. And together those projects have uh, sequestered over 10 megatons of carbon. Um, last year we took the unprecedented step to be a leader, to be a further leader in the technology and we, implement, we issued uh, uh, exploration and evaluation permits to 25 uh, for 25 CCUS hubs across the province and that will have the ability should they be built to decarbonize um, virtually every corner of the province and every industry from oil and gas electricity um, oil sands um, petrochemical hydrogen uh, fertilizer uh, natural gas uh, power production it's the, the, the opportunities are incredible. But to get there, we need to provide companies with the certainty they need. Um, we're competing with the United States for resources, capital resources. Um, we, uh, we're behind the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act and the incentives they're operating. So we have more work to do, but I see the opportunities tremendous in uh, CCUS. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. Evelyn Asselin, Radio-Canada. Um, a lot of this plan is based on technology that hasn't been proven or that needs to be scaled. Um, how realistic or how much of this is solid with the objective of 2050 based on those technologies? Well, I think that's part of the key to our, to our plan is you can't just pick random targets with a random date and with random reduction targets and say, we're going to get there. Um, we have to do the hard work, and that's what our plan is going to do. We're going to, to do it sector by sector to look at abatement curbs, CO2 abatement, carbon abatement curbs, to understand what is viable. 
uh, where, where is technology today? Uh, what technology has to come to scale? How can we finance these projects? How expensive are they going to be? Who's going to pay for them? Do we have the regulatory process to deliver? And in what time frame uh, do we have uh, the, the ability to mobilize capital in a world where every country is looking to do the same thing we, we are here in Canada and Alberta is to lower emissions. So we know that the, we know that we need to do more. We know that we want to get to, to net zero by 2050, but we have to be realistic. We have to do the hard work and find out what's possible, and that's what our plan is doing. Did you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, where um, there's no interim targets and accountability measure in the plan. Well, you're, you're right. So some will see not having interim hard regulated targets as a gap. They'll see that as a gap. But I don't, I don't see it as a gap because before we regulate or impose limits on specific industries and interim targets, there's more work to be done. We have to see what's achievable. Um, we have to undertake a comprehensive studies, and these are massive comprehensive due diligence studies on sector by sector assessments to find viable pathways to understand the technology, to understand the cost, who's going to pay for it, what policies and programs have to come together. We need to know what's achievable and what's possible because you can't build a plan with, with, by just picking a random target, attaching it to a random date, and just hope that it will magically work. You can't, you, it just doesn't work that way. Hoping that you are going to somehow magically reach a target is not a plan. Hope is not a plan. You need to do the hard work to find out targets that are achievable. Otherwise, you'll just miss that target. And we've seen that over and over again. I believe Canada has missed nine targets over the years. So we can't do, we have to do things differently. We can't just pick a random target. And believe me, when we, when we uh, are, do complete this work and this assessments, we'll know what's possible. And we'll move in true Alberta fashion to, uh, to, to be the best at it and to get ahead of every other jurisdiction in the world. All right, thank you very much, folks. Uh, let's move on to questions on the line. Um, operator, could you please put forward the first caller? Aaron Collins, CBC. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Um, Minister Savage, in your message at the, at the beginning of the document that you released today, you write that you're completing comprehensive assessments of technology, pathways of industry, experts in each sector, uh, costs, timeframes, uh, basically the nuts and bolts of this, uh, the things that are needed to accelerate emissions reduction. So one would think that you need those assessments and that they're key to creating an actual plan to reach net zero. So without them, my question is, why release this document today? Why not wait? This feels premature. Well, I think it's important that we have a, a, cli a climate plan. We've, we're, we're behind. I wish this plan had been out two years ago, but we, we know we have work to do. Sure, it could have been released in another year's time, but then that's another year's time lost. I, I can tell you that I've spent uh, the last four years talking to international audiences, whether it's the financial se sector and community or energy conferences or at COP27. And when I talk about the record of Alberta and this tremendous long environmental legacy, people are shocked. They don't know that because we haven't packaged it up into one solid document that talks about this record and this continuation and this evolution of our plan. So that's long overdue. Um, yes, I would have liked to have had those interim targets done, but that takes time. And the choice between taking the time to do it and not releasing a climate plan until that's done or releasing it now, that choice is really, really obvious. Our energy sector, our industry want a plan. They want to see us moving forward. We have a tremendous record to be proud of. So that's why we're putting it out, putting it out now. And it is part of our my mandate letter from Premier Smith. There's a new focus on on environment and, and emissions reduction in our government. And I think it's timely we needed this done. Did you have a follow-up? I do, yes, and thank you for that. That's uh, that's an answer. Um, uh, to to the previous question, you said hope is not a plan, right? I want to turn back to your letter. You write Alberta's aspiration of achieving a carbon neutral economy, uh, a net zero economy by 2050. So that's hope. What is it? A plan or hope today? Is it a commitment or an aspiration? 
I'm so, a little confused. So we have an aspiration to, to get to net zero. We could call it a target, we could call it a goal. Um, globally, almost every country in the world, G7 country, majority of the economies globally do have a net zero target. They call it, some call it a target, some call it an aspiration, some legislate it, some don't, some regulate it. Everybody has a different method of talking about their, their net zero aspiration or target. You have to have one, you have to have one. Um, the, interim, the, the interim actions are, are essential, and I guess I would just say, you know what, Albertans want results. They don't necessarily want targets, and especially targets that aren't, aren't achievable. So yes, we have an aspiration for, for net zero, but don't count Alberta out. If there's any place on the planet that can achieve this and can roll up their sleeves and has that get her done attitude, it's Alberta, and we're building on decades of environmental progress in this area. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, operator, could you please put forward the next question? Harry Tate, Globe and Mail. Hi, Minister. Thanks for taking my question. Um, a climate plan is something that is, you know, fundamental to the future of Alberta. I'm curious, um, where's the Premier? I know she's busy, but this is sort of a uh, marquee announcement. Well, this is, uh, this is an important announcement, and it's part of our, our strategy going, going forward. It's in my mandate letter, and she's asked me to, to announce this, and, and I am. But that doesn't, the reason I'm building this strategy, the reason it's here, the reason it's developed and announced is because of her leadership and her focus and her emphasis on environment and conservation and getting it right. And when we talked about putting this plan together, uh, she was, she was clear that we need to, to have, and I, I've spoke about this many times in the past before, your climate plan has to also be an energy development plan. Your energy development plan also has to be a climate plan because you can't talk about one without the other any longer. You can't have a climate plan that's also energy. So she's, uh, she's behind this entirely. The reason we're here today is because of her leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. And my second question. Can I ask another one? Yeah, go ahead. Just Am I still here? Yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, you talk a lot about how you don't want to have random targets that, that, that they then are just not achievable, that you need a plan. And yet within this plan, you talk about taking all this time to build a plan and do studies and figure out what is necessary for funding and regulatory environment. How is what you have put forward as an aspiration not a random target when the entire point of this is talking about doing the background work. Well, sure. Well, by a random target, I mean you just pick a number, and you can point almost anywhere, very, very many places across the globe, but point to Ottawa, for instance, with a target of 42% reductions in oil and gas by 2030. That's a random target attached to a random date, and it hasn't had the necessary work done behind it to say, how are you going to get there? Um, we know to, to, to even remotely get there, we're going to need carbon capture, utilization and storage. But to do that, we're competing with everywhere else in the world that's looking to do that. We don't have the regulatory processes and timeframes and the certainty and the financing to do it. So our, our plan is not picking random targets. It's doing that work, that background work, so we know what we can, what we can achieve. And remember, we're, we're, we're about results in Alberta, not just picking a random target. And you can see that in the plan over many years, over two and a half decades of results. And with or without targets, with or without aspirations, Albertans are, are getting it done. Thank you very much, Minister. Operator, could you please put forward the next question? Catherine Grigowski, Alberta Today. And thanks for taking my question. Um, the report mentions Indigenous collaboration. In your opening remarks, you mentioned um, this panel that's going to be struck. Um, Earlier this week in Ottawa, there's testimony from Indigenous communities that have called for the AER to be disbanded, and they don't want to be consulted. They want to actually have decision-making authority when it comes to regulation. Um, why, why are you taking this approach of a panel as opposed to um, further, further regulatory say? Sure. Well, in our, in our uh, plan, we do have, and it was a great recommendation that came from the Indigenous Resource Council, IRC, and I see Stephen Buffalo here today to have uh, 
Indigenous knowledge keepers to help guide our plan and our strategy and the implementation to hold us to account and to be able to, to uh, give us advice with uh, using traditional knowledge and their viewpoints. So that's in there. Um, the situation at, at Curl is very unfortunate when they've, you've, there's been a loss of trust and confidence with a community that wasn't notified of something that's very significant to them. We need to find out what happened, and I've said right from the beginning, we're going to take a look at the processes uh, within the AER, within the industry, and ask were those processes followed. And if they were, were not followed, that's one thing. And even if they w were followed, do they need to be enhanced? And that's, that's, what needs to, that's what needs to be done. That's the approach we're taking. Catherine, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, question on electrification. So listen, here are some huge success stories. We have the largest off-grid solar farm. We have the largest solar farm in Canada. And yet some of the comments from the Premier seem to suggest that these large-scale projects are eating up valuable farmland, um, that there's a the question of reliability in the grid, and so we need more natural gas. And then on the federal side of things, there's concern that they're not going to allow for more natural gas to make up for the phase out of coal. So how do you balance solar, wind, and natural gas in the electricity grid? Well, the one thing we know for sure is that we need natural gas as baseload power. Um, our plan is more than just an environmental plan, a climate plan. It balances energy affordability, reliability, energy security. So we have to look at all of that holistically. And when we do one thing, whether it's an energy development, we have to look at emissions reduction. If we're looking at emissions reduction, we have to be very fine-tuned to reliability, affordability, energy security. So I think we need to balance that. We're really proud of the leadership in uh, the electricity sector. By They've already reduced emissions by 40%, and that's today. They're on track to reduce emissions by 61% by uh, 2030, and that's while growing electricity, growing the supply of electricity. So we're going to need all sources of electricity to, to uh, lower emissions, but it's, there's no question it's going to need baseload natural gas to get there. We will not and cannot sacrifice reliability. We live in a cold country. People need to know that their lights are on, that their power is, is on, that they're going to have warm, warm homes. But we know we have to balance it, and our plan is, is designed specifically to have guardrails guardrails on what, what, what we're doing to not sacrifice and compromise people's ability to have reliable, secure energy. All right. Thank you very much, Minister. Operator, could you please put forward the next question? Chris Barco, Calgary Herald. Hi, Minister. Uh, you talked about these comprehensive uh, assessments that are going to be done on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. What will be the timing of that? And at the end of it, do you expect to put in place either interim targets or targets uh, by 2050? But I guess really interim targets is what I'm talking about for each individual sector. Is that the plan? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We've got, uh, we've got uh, out for an RFP looking for a third-party independent uh, uh, help to to build these abatement curves, and that, that, there's a lot of work in there. It's uh, it's not not simple. These are like due diligence on companies, when, like companies do in the private sector before they embark upon a project. We need to look at everything holistically on what can we what can we do. So take a specific sector, take a look at what the emissions profile of it are, and say, well, what are the opportunities here? Can, can we lower emissions? Do we have the technology? How long is it going to take? What's it going to cost? So that, that's going to take some, some time. I don't want to predict specifically on how long. Um, you, you saw some of that work and similar work done by Pathways, um, by Pathways on how they develop their net zero, uh, net zero target, finding credible, viable, technologically sound pathways. That's what we want to do. So I want to predict a, a, a specific time, but it's going to take a number of months at least. And uh, will we... Uh, regulate those targets. Well, I think that's going to be for the, you know, the next, the next minister to determine the next government. But I, I would think that would be practic practical if we know we have an achievable, um, realistic, um, achievable, viable, affordable 
target that's not going, that's going to fit within all the principles of our plan that include energy security, affordability, reliability, um, I, I think it would be reasonable to expect that that would be considered. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, this is a two-part. And just to go back to that last one, so I understand it. So you're saying that these, these abatement curves, that you actually would expect to see a specific target by sector at the end of it? That's the first question. The second one is I just want to ask you about the emissions cap for the oil cans. What is the timing of that, and how low do you expect that number to fall below the existing 100 megatons? Sure. Well, the emissions cap right now sits at 100 megatons. Understand the oil sands emissions sits is, is well below that, about 70 megatons of emissions. Um, they're on a path to net zero. They've got a credible plan to get there. I think it's realistic and, and logical that we can lower that emissions cap in in uh, in sync with what they're doing. But it's there's still some uncertainty in how long it's going to take them and how they can achieve that. They're dependent very heavily at the beginning part of their pathway on, on CCUS. And right now, there's a lot of uncertainties with CCUS on understanding the economics. They need, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's incentives, whether it's regulatory, whether it's policy alignment between Ottawa and Alberta, whether it's the carbon price and contracts for differentials, there's a lot of work to be done there. So you can't, uh, you, you got to make sure that where you go aligns with what, uh, you know, how quickly that policy and that framework is, is working. But I, I think it's very realistic that we can lower that emissions cap by 2030. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, operator, could you please put forward the next question? Kelly Kreiderman, Globe and Mail. Hi, Kelly. Hi there. Uh, just following up on Chris's question um, and whether targets will be regulated or legislated, is inherent in this plan today, will there eventually be legislation or regulation to enforce that 2050 goal even? Well, I think, uh, I mean, as I said before, there's a number of different jurisdictions around the world approach it differently. Um, you can look at some, some jurisdictions, and there's websites that track all of this and, and who has what types of targets and how are they achieving it. And see, the United States hasn't, hasn't, uh, has a policy. Saudi Arabia has a policy. Interestingly, Russia has legislation to impose a 2050 net zero target. But does anybody here really believe for one second that Putin will follow that legislation? So I think the, the, the question here isn't about uh, whether you legislate the targets. It's about having realistic pathways to get there and providing the supportive and the right policy frameworks to, to do it. Um, that would be for another another day, another time. Right now, we're not, we're not uh, looking at legislating an aspiration to net zero. We're not, we're not looking at legislating it. But someday, an, an, another minister, another government may, may say, you know what, we're getting there. We're, we're well on track to it. Let's, let's put it into legislation to showcase it to the world. But you know, right now, a lot of these countries that have legislative targets, there is no way in the world that they're on a path to achieve it. Kelly, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, so just on the, the potential at, of re-examining the cap on uh, oil sands emissions, specifically that 100 megaton cap, would that be legislated? And how quickly would you move to decide whether that cap needs to be lowered or not? Well, it's, it is legislated right now. The 100 megaton t cap is, is legislated. Um, it would be very simple to lower, lower that. It's not a a big new undertaking to, to change a regulation or legislation. But we can't do that until we get some certainty with Ottawa. Like, we can't do that until we know that there's a viable path forward to, to lower emissions in the oil sand. And that's going to take some work between Ottawa and Alberta. It's going to take some work for in, in Ottawa to up its game to be competitive with the United States Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there's incentives in the United States for CCUS that are, they're, it's basically, it's sucking investment out of Alberta because we're not, we're not competing with what the offer is in the United States. So we have to do, there is work. It's, uh, again, it's just not 
magical that you're, you're, you're going to get there. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes to be able to put the right policy frameworks and incentives and programs together. And in this case, the, it's compounded and more complicated because you have two jurisdictions needing to be involved. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, members. That concludes the live portion of our event. Thank you so much for coming.